to receive the word which produces faith. And faith pleases God. I'm not just a hearer of the word. I'm a doer of the word. This word has given me life and life more. Shout it like you mean it. Hallelujah. Flip to Deuteronomy chapter 30, and I want you to take a look at this. The Blind Side is a, a fascinating true story that uh, it's an unlikely relationship between uh, Michael Orr and a family, the Tuies, that took him in. Who is that, SJ? Big Mike. And uh, the central relationship between Leanne Tui and Michael Orr, and I thought that it was a kind of a strange and wonderful mother-son story. Do you have any place to stay tonight? Come on. It's almost like the universe created this family, got it going. They were doing great, and they were having all the success and the joy in the world, but something was missing. Come and get it, y'all. Everyone, thank your mother for driving to the store and getting this. Thank you, Mama. Thank you, Mama. Until Michael showed up. And the family is now complete. You know, the first time I spent the night at the house, um, you know, I felt like that's where I was supposed to be. And, you know, they made me feel at home. You know, Michael moved in to live with us full time. And uh, it had a, probably a much greater impact on our lives than we, you know, did on, on his life. Collins, do you know Big Mike from school? Michael came. I felt like everyone just gathered around. And it was a center focus. And... I felt like we were at home a lot more. And I think that's probably the best part of the story. I'm not cutting, I'm just asking. Let me tell you something, all right? We have been sitting around here for over an hour, and when I look around, all I see are people shooting the bull and drinking coffee. How can I help you? Oh, he was first. But no, you go ahead. I think I want to hear this. Me too. Leanne Tui manages to do what she wants to do in the way she wants to do it, doesn't care what it takes, how she has to do it, she, but she does it her way. And I just, I'd never met anyone like that before. Sandra has channeled Leanne Tui. It really is important to see Leanne and Sandra Bullock in the same place and have them talk. <laughs> and now that Sandra has done this morph into looking like my wife, then that's really scary. Having two Leanne's out there, <laughs> you know, that's too, too many, maybe. We've all decided, all of us who work together, that we all are going to become um, ladies who lunch with Leanne. And we're just going to follow her, because she'll fix whatever is going wrong in our lives. You know, anytime somebody does something unconventional, you have to think about the realities of that. It usually starts with a person who's able to, to look at things differently. What if? What if we brought this kid in our, in our lives? Many, many, many wonderful things have come from the blind side. People have done generous things for other people. And so, you know, we sit back and we look at that and we go, you would have to do it again. Honey, you're changing that boy's life. No. He's changing mine. The Blind Side. Hey, man. Anybody seen that movie? Sandra Bullock played that role like nobody's business. Two scriptures I want you to look at. Where did I tell you to go? Do, go to Deuteronomy. Good. Y'all got it? Good. I need to get it. Deuteronomy 30. Let's look at verse number 19. I want us to read it together. One, two, ready, read. Well, watch this. He says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you. In other words, God says, I don't want any excuses from you as to why you made the wrong choice. Because I've set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, he even makes it easy. He says, I'm going to test you, but I'm going to tell you what to pick on the test. Now, that's an easy test. Touch your neighbor and say, choose life. Now, watch this. Both you and the people after you might live. Say this. Say, every decision... I make now is affecting four generations after me. Go to one more place, Psalm 37. Psalm 37. These are familiar places. We've been here before Harvest, but I want to show it to you another way. Psalm 37. Anybody need something from God today? Anybody hungry for the word today? 
Psalm 37, verse number 23. You know this. You probably have it up on your refrigerator. The steps. Not just the steps, but, but, but I, I, I want to give it to you. I want to make it more plain for you. The decisions of a good man or, or, or a righteous man. Now say, that's me. Now, you're righteous not because you do everything right. You're righteous because he did everything right, and he lets you partake in what he did right. So the decisions of who? No, you missed it. Decisions of who? Decisions of who? Say your name. The decisions of? Are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way, though he falls. He shall not be utterly cast down because the Lord upholds him with his hand. I've been young and I've been old and I've never seen who? No, you ain't got it. Who? I'm going to give you one more again. Rewind. I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen forsaken nor your descendants begging bread. Father, you hear me, and you always hear me. Taylor, make this word now for us, God, that we can make decisions we never regret. Your word says that you have ordered our steps and you delight in our path. And so we pray now, God, that you would step in now, God, and do what only you can do and order those steps. Make it clear to us now in Jesus' name. We thank you that we're not failures. We're not mistakes. We're not accidents. We, we may have had some issues where we fell and got off the path. But the word says that even though we may fall, we shall not be utterly cast down. Because you uphold us with your hand. And we thank you that it is so in Jesus' name. High five two or three people on your way down and say, neighbor, don't get blindsided. Don't get blindsided. Don't get blindsided. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord in football. As the quarterback goes back for the drop, he has a side of him where he cannot see what's going on. This is called his. He has no clue what's going on in that area. And because of that, uh, in the movie, we see Michael Orr uh, uh, that, that we got two different levels going on here. Because one is about football, dealing with the blind side. The other blind side is dealing with the fact that this woman, Leanne uh, Tui, was confronted with making a decision out of nowhere. And she had a split second to make a decision that was going to affect her life forever. It did not just affect her life, but it also affected Michael Orr's life. Now, my question is, what if Leanne had made made a different decision. Where would Michael be today? He grew up on the south side of Memphis, Tennessee, which I can tell you is rough. He grew up in a place where his only options were to sell drugs or, 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 to, or to die. Really, those were the only two options that he had. He, he did not come from a life of privilege. He was not born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was a man in a situation where if this woman would not have heard from God and made the decision she made, even when it was a blindside decision, that this man's life would have never become what it was. Understand the decisions you make affect more than just yourself. You've got to get out of the thinking that what you do is only affecting you and is only uh, making uh, uh, changes for what you do. Every decision we make not only affects up to four generations after us, it affects those around us. Are you still here? Uh, in the movie, the wife, she is confronted with making a decision out of nowhere that could have had a possibly negative effect on her family. Her social status and her future. You saw they had the lunches with Leanne and the women were trying to question what is she doing? Is she trying to get involved in social work? Why is it that this all white family now has this African American male coming to live with them? And the women even suggested that Michael was trying to mess with the little girl. She made a decision now that could have possibly had negative effects on her social status, on her life, on her future. She, he could have been a murderer. He could have went in that house and took everything they possibly had. But Leanne, if you looked at the story, that was a Christian family. 
Which means this, that God says, I was ordering their steps even though they didn't know what I was doing. Sometimes you may not even know why you're doing what you're doing. And God is saying, baby, I'm ordering your steps. You have no clue why you're walking the way you're walking and stopping where you're stopping and interacting with the people you're interacting with. But God says, I'm ordering your steps. High five somebody say, he's ordering my steps. He's ordering He's ordering my steps. Watch this. Life presents you with blindside hits every day where you have to make decisions. And as believers, we need to know how to make decisions that we won't regret later. You can't control the future, but you can control your decisions, and your decisions determine your future. I'm going to say it again because your neighbor missed it. You cannot control the future. Uh, you can't control what happens with climate. You can't control what the government does with their uh, deficit. You can't control any of that. You can't control the future. But you can control your decisions. And your decisions determine your future. See, see, when you get the understanding that God says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, which means I don't care who's in the White House, who's in Congress, I control my decisions. And so because I control my decisions, my future looks pretty secure. I don't care how God's going to do it. I don't care what he's got to do. But I'm not worried because my future's secure because I've made decisions. And who ordered my decisions? God. Are you still here? Uh, wh watch this, watch this. Either life is going to happen to you or you're going to happen to life. You've heard me say that before. Uh, are there any violent people that, that are seizing the kingdom in their life that says, uh, the violent, the kingdom of heaven suffers violent, but violent men do what? They take it by force, which means they are focused and they're unwavering, which means a little trouble's not going to stop them. I'm so sick of people that when a little trouble comes, all of a sudden, it's like the ship has completely crashed. The Titanic has sunk. You're going to have some trouble, baby. But listen, you got to learn how to take a licking, but to Keep on ticking. You got to learn that you may lose a couple of rounds, but baby, at the end of the fight, they're going to crown me the champion. I've read the end of the book, and I found out that we win. Ah, now watch this. Watch this. Your mind was given to you to serve you in being creative and fulfilling the will of God. Here's the problem. Your mind will play tricks on you. Especially when you're trying to make decisions. Anybody want to be real that when you're trying to really make a decision that's going to affect your future, your mind will start playing tricks on you. It'll start throwing up mirages in your mind like you're in the desert somewhere and you'll think you're seeing a river over there and really it's just a mirage. Your, your mind will play tricks on you. That's why the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitfully wicked. The word heart there means mind. In Hebrew it's lev, L-E-V. It's deceitful above all things, and it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Lord, I search the heart. I try the reins. I give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. So watch this. When you're trying to make decisions, your mind will vacillate back and forth. Vacillation, literally, uh, by definition, it means to swing back and forth indecisively. On Monday, you get married. On Tuesday, they ain't the one. On Wednesday, ain't nobody perfect, though. By Thursday, you can talk to Sheila. Sheila to convince you, keep on moving. By Friday, you talk to Big Mama, and Big Mama said, leave him. So now you've got five different opinions about the decision you're supposed to make, and your mind's sitting up there playing you saying, gotcha. Why? Because it's deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? The moment you think you got yourself figured out, life will throw you a pine side, and you'll think, well, wait a minute. I thought I knew this, and I thought this, and I thought this, and uh, anybody ever been there? Now watch this. We vacillate because we don't want to fail. Who wants to fail? Who, who wants to make a decision that's not going to work? Who wants to do something that's not going to work? The truth is, is that, watch this, you cannot be afraid to make a decision and fail. Because <clears throat> the truth of the matter is, maybe because what you consider failure isn't failure. Uh, without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. Now, I told you before, without faith, another way to look at that is without stretching. Say stretching. Uh, which means this, a faith pleases God how much of the time? 100% of the time, right? So then if faith pleases God all the time, and I'm the righteousness of God, and I'm walking in faith, that means that my faith worked all the time. Which means even if I made a decision that appeared to be failure, maybe it was faith working to navigate me to the right place. 
Oh, you do understand that God always uses what you think is failure as a navigation system to get you to the right place. Listen, I'm not very good with directions. So when people try to say, Bishop, just go two blocks north and then go four blocks east. Listen, man, I don't know nothing about all that. What is it next to? <laughs> just say it's about a Popeye's across from the, from the Wendy's. Gotcha. You talking about Parker and Dartmouth. Gotcha. Why well, we got to get all technical and four blocks this? I don't know nothing about all that. So because of that, you know what I do? I get out my navigation system. And my navigation system will tell, you know, she talks to you, you know. And she'll tell you, listen, uh, 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 you got uh, go straight. Okay, got that. And, and then you keep going straight. And, and then if you got the sprint navigation, it don't always catch up on time. So by the time you finish going straight, she say, make a U-turn. You're headed the wrong way. And I'm saying, but look here, little girl, I was following you. <laughs> Watch this. But she's got the end destination programmed in her. So even if I take a step or make a move or go a certain direction that looks like it was the wrong direction, she's got a way to say, I can fix this. Make a U-turn. And that's how God does with you. God says you may have made uh, going a little too far this time. You may have went a little too far to the left, a little too far to the right. But, baby, I got a way to fix this. Make a U-turn right here. And if you come back to me, I'll be standing with open arms for you. Anybody ever had to make a U-turn? Sometimes what you consider failure is not failure. It's faith navigating you the right way. Are you still here? Watch this, watch this. Scripture says, Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain thee. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. Now, let's read this again since you know how to translate now. Use, use Bible college, honorary student today. Cast your cares on the Lord and he's going to handle it. He'll never suffer the righteous. Who's that? Y'all still ain't got it. Who's that? He'll never suffer to be moved. What was this? Part of our problem when we're making decisions is that we want to control every aspect of the decision. Your neighbor is a raging control freak. You're real spiritual, but they're, they, they, they want to control everything. They got to control how it happens and who does it and the way they say it and the way they move and the way they talk. And uh -uh, I didn't say uh, they, they want to control everything. And God says, that's not how I work. God says, you're supposed to give me the problems. What's this? Say, Lord, I cast my cares on you. Here's what that means. You give God the stuff you can't handle. And you do your part. You sitting up here worried about trying to get an income tax return. You can't fix the I and the R and the S. So your job is to say, God, you got this. Now I'm going to do my part. I'm going to call customer service and file a complaint. But as far as everything else, that's your job. God says, would you please stop trying to fix stuff that is my job to fix? You sitting up here trying to be super saint and super Christian and fix every little thing. And God says, but you didn't read your Bible. Your Bible said, cast your cares, cast your worry, cast your anxiety. Give it to me. You know what cast means? Cast means, boom, that's your. That's no longer my problem. Touch your neighbor and say, abandon your problems. Now you do your part. Because many saints will think that and they'll just say, well, child, I'm just waiting on the Lord. No, you got to do your part. Let, let, me help, let me give you a very practical example because I'm in Denver. Let's say you're believing God for a new car. Now, you say, God, I, I can't control what the bank doing. I can't control the fact that, you know, the midnight train came before in my life and picked something up. Oh, please understand, you've been places sometimes where... You woke up that morning and thought you'd see it out there. And 
Oh, I forgot. Bougie folk in Denver don't know nothing. I'm joking. Watch this. So you say, God, I can't control the bank. I can't control what they're doing. I can't control anything about that. Here's what I can do. I can fill out the application. I get my pay stubs together. I can provide proof of this. I can provide proof of that. Now, outside of that, I can't do nothing else about this. Do, do you see how this works? So you say, God, I'm not going to sit up here trying to take cookies to the finance man and trying to convince them that they need. No, I ain't going to do that. That's your job. My job is to do what I can do. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, now, now watch this. There are two types of decisions. Say two. There are two types of decisions. The, the first kind of decision you have to make are ones you have time to prepare for. Of course, we love those kinds of decisions. Flip over to Luke 14 real quick. Luke 14. Luke 14. Hallelujah. Y'all got it? It's on my paper. I got it. Luke 14, verse 25. You have it? Now watch this. And there were great multitudes with him, and he turned and said to them, If any man come to me and hate. Now the word hate there is the Greek word medio, which means love less. It doesn't literally mean to hate. It just means to love less. So he says, If any man comes to me and does not love his mother, father, wife, children, and sisters less than me, he can't follow me. Because uh, the, the truth is, is many people have problems making decisions that benefit the kingdom because they love everybody else more than they love him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And evidence of your love is what you do. You can sit up and tell me all day long, oh, Bishop, I just love you. Oh, thank you. Oh, Mitsubishi and all that. But if your actions do not correlate and correspond to what you're saying, then, then all you have is a love that's from your mouth. Anybody ever been loved by somebody that the love stopped at their mouth? The oh, I'll do anything. Baby, I'll give you the rain, the moon, the stars, the this, the that. And then you ask for a cheeseburger. And he goes, why can't you get up and go get the cheeseburger yourself? I just finished working all day. Now, wait a minute. Now, you told me you loved me and you was going to give me the sun, the moon, the rain, and the stars. Now, I'm asking you for a double cheeseburger. Shall preach, Bishop. God says, if you're going to make decisions that are going to work, you have to love everybody else less than you love me. That's what he says. He says, you got to love me way more than you love your mama. Because the decisions you got to make, your mama may not like them. Your daddy may not like them. Your wife may not like them. Your children may not like them. Your brothers and sisters may not like them. But if you want to make decisions that please God, you got to get over getting cosigners. Don't look for everybody close to you to co-sign on the decisions you have to make. In fact, sometimes evidence is the right decision is because they won't co-sign. Are you still here? Now watch this, watch this. And verse 27, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So watch this. The, the first point I need you to get about making decisions that you have time to prepare for is don't look for everyone close to you to co-sign. And connected to that, listen, listen. Don't go around asking everybody what they think. People with good intentions will think you right out of God's plan. They mean well and they say a lot of Bible verses, but God say, I ain't got nothing to do with that. Devil quote the Bible too. That don't mean nothing. Don't be impressed by super saints that can quote scripture. And you think, wow. They know that Bible. That's it. They know it. They don't show it. Study to show yourself approved. Don't you study to know, you study to show. Which means if you know it, it ought to be reflected in your fruit. Yeah, so, so the first thing is don't look for everybody close to you to co-sign you. The voice of God and the voice of your leadership will always be one. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Many people in the body of Christ mess it up because, because somehow they think they got a private line. Uh, there used to be a song, some of y'all may know it, they used to sing in the country, said, I got a telephone in my bosom. Oh, y'all don't know. <laughs> Anybody? Y'all, okay. That's deep, sound. That's. <laughs> they said, I got a telephone in my bosom, and I can ring them up from right down here. You, come on now. Come on, sing it, daughter. You got it. Listen, God will always speak to you through the voice of your man of God, 
and he'll speak to you through the word of God. Logos and rhema. Those voices will always correspond. You got it? But the second thing about making decisions you have time to prepare for is bear the cross. The easy way might not be, oh, I says, the easy way might be the hard way. I'm going to say it again. The easy way might be the hard way. This looks easy on the front end. But on the back end, there's a whole lot of stuff in there that you didn't plan on and you didn't plan for. Uh, so Jesus said, you got to learn how to bear your cross. Bear your cross means sometimes to make decisions that are going to please him, that you won't regret, is sometimes it's going to be what looks to be the hard way. But truthfully, it's the easy way. If you're always looking for comfort, you'll never make the right decisions. Come on, somebody. If you're looking for comfort, you'll never go work out because who likes sweating and all that? Now, you may. I don't. Are you here? <laughs> Say, bear the cross. Uh, the easy way might really be the hard way. Look at verse 28. For which of you intending to build a tower sit not down first and counts the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he have laid the foundation, he's not able to finish it. All that behold it begin to mock him. And asking, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king goes to make war against another king, sits not down first and consults, whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an, amb he sends an ambassador and desires conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever uh, he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. Now, when he says forsake, a lot of people will take this and say, well, see, God wants you to be in poverty. No. The word forsake and the word uh, hate there just mean love less. So God says, if you love your job more than you love me, keep your job, but you'll lose me. And you may keep getting that check every two weeks, but you lost me, and you lost what I had planned for you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Uh, watch this. The third thing I need you to get, the decisions you have time to prepare for, is make preparations to decide. Uh, some of us, I'm talking to your neighbor, not you, uh, they live life in the fast lane. And they always run and doing something, yet they ain't doing nothing. I know that is an appropriate use of the English language, but you follow my statement. Uh, make preparations to decide. So here's that. Uh, with that, don't make decisions when you're stressed. You'll always make the wrong move. Don't ever make decisions out of stress. It'll always be the wrong move. Why? Because you're going to go what relieves your stress. You're going to go for convenience. Don't do that. Connect it to that. Clean out your car. I know y'all was eating for some deep Hebrew word there. Mm -hmm. You will not be able to focus. Watch this. It is a subconscious thing. Your mind makes decisions. It literally, think of your mind as a living room. Let's put it in context. Think of your mind as your automobile. It's got all these moving parts, and you don't quite know how all the moving parts work together. You just know that they move together and move the car. If your car has got eight months worth of history in there. You got McDonald's cups and Wendy's cups and progress reports for when your child was in third grade. They are now in high school when you, you got social security cards and birth certificates. Somebody they ain't got to go to identity theft. They just look on your car and they got everything. Your insurance is mixed up with coupons you just want in church today and all of that. Listen, clean your car out. When your car is clean, watch this, your mind will begin to make decisions in a clean environment. Connected to that, the very next thing, I'm sure you've got deductive logic so you can figure it out. Clean out your house. Come on, I'm going to sit here and make some decisions. Not with eight loads of laundry sitting on your bed. You're not going to make any decision that's right. Ooh, I've just been busy. Child, and go in the late 30 minutes late, work 30 minutes late, and, and, and get your bed together. Y'all was shouting when I was talking about. Clean out your house. 
Let me, let me be real specific, because some of y'all idea, some people got these warped ideas of cleaning. You know them, because you'll say, go clean this up, and they just. <laughs> That's not cleaning. Cleaning means, when was the last time I used this? I ain't used this. Uh, 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 uh. Cleaning means throwing away stuff that you don't use. Stop talking about one day. It's been 10 years. One day ain't coming. Sell what you don't need. Now be smart now. Sell what you don't need that still has value. And if you can't sell it, give it away. And if it's junk, throw it away. I promise you, some of y'all do. We ain't got to wait to spring cleaning. This is, this is good fall cleaning, end of summer fall cleaning. Because watch this. Your mind views things the way your house is. So, so many times it's easy. I can make decisions fairly easy because my home looks like a hotel. Don't look like nobody lived there. You understand what I'm saying? Now, I'm not saying you have to go do that. But I am saying, if those things are all messed up, you're not going to be able to make good decisions. And y'all know it's the truth. Because you'll go in that bedroom and sit down and talk about, I'm just going to pray and just get in the presence of God and make a decision. And you turn over there and take one look at them clothes, and all of a sudden, you out the presence. You didn't stepped out of the presence of God and stepped into the presence of cheer. You are now in a whole... Fourth thing I got to give you, because I got to move. Before doing something drastic, make sure that's the God option. I was chatting with a pastor not too long ago, and he was sharing with me some of his frustration. He said, Bishop, these people, just, they just, they're just getting on my nerves, and they don't do right, and, and they just, I'm, just, I'm just through. I, just, I said, well, what you going to do? He said, well, I just want to shut the church down and just be through. I said, well, have you cons is that the only option? Well, I'm just so frustrated. I said, but this is the wrong time to make that decision because you're doing it out of frustration and stress. I said, what about if you're having issues with these folk catch a division, why don't you just start a satellite location with people that can catch division, let the non-vision catchers be over here, and they can all not catch it together, and then the ones that can catch it, put them over here so they can catch it together, because he said they're running out the good ones. They don't. I said, okay, so why do you have to shut down the whole thing to, to accomplish what you're trying to do? Maybe this is more for you than it is for them. Maybe God is trying to stretch you. So he said, wow, Bishop. I never even looked at it that way. That's the word of the Lord to me. I said, that's called good decision making. And it is the word of the Lord. But you, some of y'all will make drastic things. But it doesn't have to be that drastic. Just because you're frustrated. Make sure before you do something drastic, it's the God option. Because God, watch this, is only obligated to pay for what he orders. So if you go out there doing a lot of stuff and he didn't order that, he's like, okay. I'll pay for that, but I, I can't do that. You got that. Fifth thing, making decisions. Y'all liking this? Decisions you have time to prepare for. Count the cost in advance. Uh, many people in the body of Christ uh, think that faith is the absence of wisdom. No. Faith isn't the absence of wisdom. It's the presence of possibility. And you have to learn how to manage possibility. Otherwise, possibility will turn into destruction. So let me give you some very practical things. You have to envision what the decision will produce. This is how you count the cost. Bishop, how do I do that? Get a whiteboard out. Stop trying to figure out stuff in your mind. Didn't the Bible just tell you your mind is deceitfully wicked? So the moment you think you got it figured out, your mind is going to play with you and say, oh, but what about that? And then you're going to make up a decision. Am I talking to anybody? Then you'll make a decision, and then you'll, you'll have it set, and then you'll go a couple of days. I know what I'm going to do. I know what I'm going to do. Then your mind will say, but you didn't think about that. And then now all of a sudden, you had your mind made up. Your heart is fixed. No room, no vacancy. Sold out. And now all of a sudden, things have changed. So you have to get a whiteboard out. Get a chalkboard out. Get a piece of paper out. If you got an iPad iPad out. Got it? And what you need to do is write out each problem you need to tackle with all the options. 
you getting this? Now, this requires maturity. Immature people are going to listen to this and say, that is real good for somebody else, but I know how to make decisions. How's that working out? You have to use wisdom. Faith isn't the absence of wisdom. Well, I'm just trusting God. And God says, good, but I, but I want you to have wisdom too. Prudence, have that as well. Are you getting it? Now, watch this. When you're making decisions, turn off the phone. You're trying to make decisions, talking about, I'm just believing God, Lord, just I'm going to get in your presence so I can make the right decision. What you doing? Oh, just sitting here, just trying to make some decisions. Do you know what happened to me at work today? Let me tell you what they did. They just stole and destroyed the opportunity for you to make the right decision and to hear from God. And it's not their fault. You need to learn how to put it on vibrate. And if you have one of those phones that vibrates louder than it rings, then put it on silent. Some of them, the vibration is louder than the ring. Turn the phone off. Then don't be turning off for four and five hours being weird. No, I'm serious now. I just got to say it real plain now. Because somebody's going to take what I'm preaching today and go home tonight and folk going to be looking for you, mama and them calling for you, Aunt Susan and them calling. Where they at? Where they at? I was just in the presence of God. Be weird with it. Somebody say amen. amen. Now watch this, watch this. You can only solve one problem at a time. Got it? Now, they may be interconnected, but you can only solve one piece of the pie at one time. It's just like in mathematics, when you're solving a long equation, what are the first thing they teach you to do? Break that equation down and solve the easiest parts first. You got it? Now, here's the next thing when you're making decisions. Take a periodic break and come back to it. Don't sit there and spend, just as I said, five hours trying to figure out one problem. You're going to be so sick of seeing that thing, you're just going to say, whatever. Just whatever happens. Am I telling the truth in harvest today? Last piece to this in counting the cost. Your mind needs to see each problem tackled and finalized. Otherwise, it will continue to wake it up. And you'll be asleep. And because you have unresolved decisions, your mind will wake you up and say, what are you going to do about this? Anybody been there? Now, so here's what you got to do. Think of it like this. When you go to the bank and you hand them a check or you hand them some cash money or whatever you do, you go to the bank, you, you give them the money. As you're doing that, they give you a what? A receipt. The purpose of the receipt is so that you know that the bank received what you gave them and the transaction is final. It's complete. Now, here's the truth of the matter. You don't know what they're doing with your money. You don't know where they took those checks. You, you, matter of fact, if you depend on who you bank with, you know, you may have to make copies of the receipts, get the teller's license and social security number and all that. Because they'll accidentally lose your stuff. But when you get that receipt, what do you say to yourself? This money is, it's in the bank. It's a done deal. Same way your mind works. When you are making a decision, finalize it. And say to yourself, it's a done deal. Your mind will then leave that problem alone. Because in your mind, you got your receipt. Are you getting this? And it's real simple stuff. But many times, you know, we, we get all caught up in the hoopla, but we don't know how to sit down and make decisions. You know how to cast out devils and speak in tongues, but you can't decide nothing. That's, that's not balance. You know how to pray and shout and jump and hoop and all that, and that's great, but you can't sit down and decide nothing. It takes you 20 minutes to decide where you're going to eat. Somebody say, preach, Bishop. Uh, but now watch this. I got five minutes. The second type of decision that we have the opportunity to make is a blindside decision. It's a decision where you have to react quickly. Remember, the first kind of decision is the ones you have time to prepare for. The second kind of decision is a blindside decision. Somebody say, blindside. Flip over to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. You got it? Amen. Good. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided Negev and Ziklag, and they had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women of all whom were there, both young and old. They killed 
none of them, but carried them off as they went their way. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Has anybody ever had a day in your life where you felt like what David was going through right there? Like, it's just like all of a sudden, all of this stuff just began to come. And now you, when you left, things were in order. And by the time you get back, things are in utter chaos. Verse 4, so David and his men wept aloud till they had no strength left to weep. They cried so much and they wept so much that they said, we can't even cry no more. Powder was coming out. David's two wives had been captured, uh, uh, Anilom of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in his spirit because his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Go, the son of Amalek, bring me the ephod. Say prayer garment. Verse 8, And David inquired of the Lord, watch what he says, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Watch this. Pursue them, he answered, and you'll certainly take them and succeed in the rescue, or you shall recover all. Now watch, watch this. David was in great distress because his life now it looks like it's in shambles. Everything they had worked for, everything they had put their time in for, they show up one day and all of a sudden everything is messed up. Now, as David's in this place in his life, David has an opportunity to make a decision. Tell somebody say a decision. Uh, David could have sat there and had his pity party, crying all night, feeling bad for himself. Well, nobody understands me. Nobody knows what I've been through. Nobody's got it this hard. Nobody's had to deal with this. Nobody's had to f face what I'm facing. Nobody's uh, been a single parent. Nobody's had to do this. Nobody's had to do this. He could have had a pity party and took out his tissues. But the Bible says he encouraged himself. In other words, David said, I'll cry about this later. But right now, I've got some decisions to make about my future. You don't have time to be sitting up crying over what they did to you, over how they treated you, over what they said to you, over what's gone. You got to look at yourself and say, wait a minute, baby, we'll cry about this later. Now is not the time to cry. Now is the time to make some decisions about my future. Have five somebody and say, don't cry now, baby. You got some decisions to make. You, you don't have time to sit there feeling sorry for yourself and sulking and sitting up eating bonbons watching Oprah. You got to encourage yourself. Anybody ever been there where you've had to encourage your... I want to cry, but now's not the time to cry. I, I want to feel bad for myself, but now's not the time to feel bad. I want to sit there and look at how they did me and what they said and what they shouldn't have done. But now's not the time to cry. Watch this. He, he, he said, it's not the time to cry. I don't have time, David said, to be stuck in a depression. I don't have time to get caught up with all of this emotional baggage. Please, please understand me. Whenever you go through something traumatic in life, you need to understand that all of the extra emotions attached to it are designed to stop you. Because the enemy wants you to sit there in a depression, in a pity party with your tissues crying, not answering the phone because you're so busy looking at what left, you forget what stayed. You're so busy looking at who ain't there no more that you forgot about the ones that were still there. Don't you give that much value to some... If people want to walk out of your life, baby, let them... What You're not hearing what I'm saying. It's not even worth your tears. High five somebody say, it ain't worth your tears. Why are you sitting up here crying about that house? Obviously, if God allowed it to be taken, it wasn't what he desired in the... Why are you crying about that job? Obviously, if God didn't let it work the way, didn't you say he ordered your steps? So if he ordered your steps up out of that, why are you crying about it? Are you still here? It's not even worth your tears. The psalmist Mary said, I'm not going to cry. I don't got the time. Because you're not, you didn't know she was a psalmist. Because you're not a wife. My tears. But if you do have a breakdown in that moment and do have to cry, just realize that those tears are watering your future. Because the Bible says weeping may endure. 
In other words, God says, if, if, if you'll just hold on, baby, you may be weeping right now, but if you'll just... I says, the Bible says he was discouraged and he was distressed. Watch this. The root of discouragement is insecurity. When you're discouraged, it's because you're insecure. Bishop, what, what do you mean? You're insecure about God's love and his plans for you. Because if you were secure about his love for you, you learned last week that you just say, well, I don't know how he's going to fix this. I don't know how this is going to work out. The truth is, is maybe I did do something wrong and I, I don't know, but I, I, I don't know how this is going to get itself worked out. But I know that 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 I that I know that I know that I know I was young. But now I'm old. And I've never seen him let me down before. And if he hasn't let me down before, why would he start now? I know that he loves me. But not only do I know he loves me. I know his plans concerning my future. Jeremiah 29 and 11. I know the thoughts and the plans that I have for you. They're good. They're not evil, contrary to you, to give you a hope and a future and a, an expected end. When you're discouraged, it's because right quick you had a spiritual situation of amnesia. Where you forgot that he was the one making the plans. And because he interrupted your plan, you thought that something was wrong. God just said, wait a minute, baby. I'm the one writing this script. And I know you had your plans. But I know the plans that I have. And what you got to do is not get so married to your plans that when my plan shows up, you won't accept it. Uh, he was discouraged. And he was distressed. And the Bible says he encouraged himself. There was nobody around him to encourage him. He couldn't call the prayer line. He couldn't come down to the front to the prayer partners. He couldn't get to the bishop. He couldn't get to the saints. He couldn't get to anybody. He couldn't get to harvestcc.me. He couldn't get to bishopformer.com. He couldn't get to 87755 bishop. No, he couldn't get to none of that. All David could do was say, I got a choice. I can either sit here and be a victim. Or I can say, this is the that the Lord has made. And I'm choosing, not because I want to, not because I even feel like it, but I'm choosing to rejoice and be made glad. Because David said, I'm through. David said, I don't have time to be sitting here in no pity party. I have some decisions to make that are going to affect, watch this, not just me, but all of these men and their families. So you know what David did? David, he could have sat there. He could have called over his friends to have a sulking party. Somebody said he could have got tissues for all of his issues. But David said, ah, didn't I write songs? I'm going to let you think about that for a minute. <laughs> David said, wait a minute. Psalm 37, 23, I wrote that. Sometimes you got to remind yourself of the stuff you be encouraging other people with. Sometimes you got to say, and look at yourself in the mirror and say, wait a minute. You better encourage yourself. You're walking around giving everybody else advice and counsel. You better use what you wrote yourself, David. David, you said the step of a righteous man or David had to have a reminiscence right quick. David had to say, wait a minute. I'm the one that said my steps were ordered. So if God let them see Ziglag, that must mean that there's something on the other side of this decision that's going to profit us greatly. So David didn't sit there crying no more. Uh -uh. He said, 
go get my prayer garment. He said, I'm finna pray. And he asked a simple question. Hey, Lord, I'm not even going to sit here and complain about it. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you all how bad it is. You know how bad it is. You saw what they did when they did it to me. Stop giving God a CNN news report about what folk did to you and about what's happening to you. He saw it when it happened. And he could have stopped it. And since he didn't, that must mean he ordered it. David said, shall I pursue? And God, if the answer to that is yes, I need to know I'm going to overtake. Take over. And God says, pursue, overtake, and without failure, you're going to recover. You may have made some bad decisions in your past, but God says, if you'll just realize that I order your steps. Now, let me give this to you. The question is, Bishop, well, how do I know that I'm doing the right thing? That, that's the whole thing about faith, is that if you knew, it wouldn't be faith. Faith isn't annoying. Faith is annoying. Not, not annoying. A-N-N-O-Y. No, no, no. Faith is not a knowing. Faith is a knowing. Now, you, you, your neighbor ain't getting it. Faith is saying, I don't know about all of that. But I know about that. I can't control Sheila. I can't control Craig Neal. I can't control none of that. But I can control my decisions. Come on, be a good class and connect the dots. And while I can't control the future, I can control my decisions. And my decisions affect my future. Which means this, Harvest, every day you get up, here's what you pray. Lord, I thank you that on this day, you've ordered my steps. And every decision I make is what you desire. In Jesus' name. Now, when you pray that, let me tell you what you do. You create an insurance policy where God is obligated to pay on. When you came down to this altar and gave your lives to the Lord and recommitted your lives or whatever you did, and you said, Lord, I receive, I believe in my heart, confess with my mouth, you created an insurance policy. And God was obligated to pay salvation for that. So when I wake up in the morning and I say, God, this is the day you've made. And I, because my steps are ordered according to your word in Psalm 37, 23, every decision I make today will be what you desire. So now, my faith isn't in the decision. My faith is in him. Are you getting this? And when you create an insurance policy like that, God says, all right, I got you. I'll pay out for that. I'll cover that. I'll pay for that. Why? Because sometimes you're going to be blindsided. And you don't have time to take out your whiteboard. You don't have time to sit down and turn your phone off. Matter of fact, sometimes you're going to have to make decisions right there on the phone. And if you start your day saying, God, every decision I make today, you've ordered. Because my steps, my decisions are ordered by you, established by you. Then when you have to make blindside decisions, you'll never make a decision that you will ever regret. Anybody excited about that? I tell you, if you're excited about that, to hop on your feet and just let God know how excited you are about the fact that he's ordered your steps.